Welcome to Sense and Sustainability, your podcast channel for sustainable procurement. We hope you like what you hear. Please go to www.iso2400.org for more information, learning resources, tools and much more. Welcome everybody to our podcast series, uh, Sense and Sustainability, where we try to get behind the, the characters, the people that have been involved in sustainable procurement for many years uh, to understand how they got to where they got to, why they got to where they got to, and then what they're doing now and, and how they see the future in sustainable procurement. So I'm delighted to welcome my old friend and colleague, Luca Guzabocca from Italy. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Luca. I usually get it wrong. To, uh, to talk to us about your life and your career. Yeah, first of all, uh, Sean, thank you very much for your invitation. I am very proud of it because, of course, uh, we have been in contact uh, since uh, many years ago, and uh, I'm very happy to share uh, with you something about my experience and life career. So, I, as you know, of course, uh, I have uh, almost 27 years of experience in procurement management. So, I started in a small company. Uh, actually, I started as a designer of uh, uh, electronic systems, something like that. I don't know if it is the right uh, you know, translation in English, uh, because, of course, uh, I am graduated as an electronics technician or something like that. I mean, and uh, so the first company I joined was uh, for this kind of job. And that's, of course, my, my boss, after a couple of years, asked me if uh, I wanted to, you know, to, to join the design department, the research and development department, or the procurement department. Actually, at that time, I was alone. I, mean, I was at the procurement department. I was a single person because this company was very small, uh, almost 15 employees. And, you know, because of my way of uh, managing the relationship, you know, with uh, people, I prefer to join the procurement uh, function. And from that time, so I started to work in procurement uh, organization. After this kind of experience uh, in which I procured, uh, you know, any kind of electronic components, uh, uh, sub-assemblies, uh, uh, external services to assembly, printed circuit boards, uh, uh, and such kind of things. Uh, it, it was that company, uh, you know, in the market of uh, the electrical and electronic appliances. Uh, after that, I joined other companies. Actually, my career uh, has been shared in seven companies, uh, different kind of size, different kind of market. Uh, I started from electronics and uh, then I went through, uh, you know, electrical and electronic uh, appliances for residential and civil uh, application. Then I started to work for uh, multinational companies like Black & Decker Power Tools uh, and the GlaxoSmithKline, uh, two different markets. The first is the households uh, or the do-it-yourself power tools. Uh, the second uh, in the pharma industry. Um, so that's my briefly my, my, my career in terms of procurement management. So, Luca, what, what did you what did you learn throughout that that long career in procurement? What, what's your philosophy around what, what makes a procurement person successful? Actually, uh, because uh, I have a lot of experience in procurement. Uh, to be frank, I started as uh, all the buyers started, uh, so I was a macho buyer, which means for me uh, just. Uh, the cost saving objective as first priority so squeeze supplier squeeze <laughs> all the quotation for suppliers in in that time so at the beginning was was this maybe today is still <laughs> the same for yeah. you know, we, we all started supplier. that way in procurement didn't we exactly. <laughs> to be frank i'm talking about my life uh, and and then um, through the, the the years of my careers i changed the approach even because uh, Working in small company is different than a big multinational company where maybe, uh, you know, uh, aspects like uh, the quality, the partnership with suppliers, uh, uh, the service for suppliers, uh, the innovation side, uh, working with suppliers, uh, they are more, uh, you know, popular and more familiar in the multinational company than in the small companies. No? So, and when I embrace the, the multinational company, so I... Uh, changed my my view uh, and uh, I started to work uh, 
uh, not only for the cost saving objective, but for other kind of objectives. Uh, and that's my, my experience. So I, I used to say, uh, I changed it from the macho buyer to a smart buyer, no? uh, where, of course, the buyer doesn't look on, only at the, you know, the savings and, uh, and the, you know, the cost reduction objective, but also other kinds of uh, you know, aspects which can bring a, a real value to the company and to the procurement professionalism as well. So, Luca, we first met, I think, when you were at GSK. And you'd started a not-for-profit in Italy around sustainable procurement uh, about the same time as I started my business in the UK Action Sustainability. What made you do that? As I actually, yes, uh, I remember very well my, our first meeting in, uh, in London a few years ago. And uh, yes, Acquista Sostenibilità, which was uh, the not-for-profit organization uh, you are talking about, uh, has uh, been established one year after your action sustainability. I remember very well. So, and um, well, I started to uh, to be passionate of sustainable procurement early 2000. And then when I uh, I met uh, Angelo, uh, who is my mate uh, in the Acquisition Sustainability, uh, you know, uh, wish and dream. So we, we established uh, this not-for-profit organization in order to inspire people, inspire buyers across Italy, inform them, train them, and uh, just to, to bring on the table of discussion the sustainable management of procurement. This actually uh, came from, um, you know, my experience uh, that, of course, uh, cost saving uh, was not uh, the only one objective of procurement or shouldn't uh, be the, the only one objective of cost reduction. And I started to look at, first of all, uh, the website information. So I navigated a lot uh, across the website. And even, of course, I found uh, action sustainability in that time as other kind of organization of activities around the world in terms of sustainable procurement. And so my, I, I was convinced that uh, procurement uh, can have a, really a very significant, uh, you know, activity in order to change uh, the way to manage procure in a more sustainable way. So, you know, the number of suppliers, uh, the power you have in your hands when you have to select suppliers and products and services uh, and such kind of things, uh, it made me really very very conscious uh, about the fact that a procurement can make the difference, yeah. So you moved from GSK into the financial services sector. How, how was that for you? What, what was the transition like? Because I, I think you weren't just looking after procurement then, you looked after IT as well, as I remember correctly. Well, I, actually, um, as I mentioned before, uh, I had uh, seven experiences in seven uh, different companies, uh, size, geography and, and market. GSK was one of my, you know, gap in the procurement management uh, uh, context because before I used to work uh, only for manufacturing uh, companies. Uh, GSK is a manufacturing company, but uh, I used to be in charge of indirect uh, and services, uh, uh, you know, uh, procurement. So this was another big gap uh, for me because I changed it from, uh, you know, manage procurement in the manufacturing side. So bill of materials, uh, raw materials, components, and blah, blah, blah. And then in GSK, I changed it in managing services uh, in direct materials. This is another gap. The second gap was, uh, you know, between the pharma industry and the banking industry. And that's another big difference because I needed to, you know, to change my approach because, of course, the financial system is different in terms of procurement management. In that time, it was the 2008, so even, you know, a time in which uh, the financial system was in, in crisis, of course. And so they, they, they recruited me because they wanted to put inside, uh, you know, their processes a new way to manage procurement. So a more, uh, let me say, aggressive or more different uh, a way to manage procurement coming from, uh, you know, a, a very mature system of procure goods and services. Um, yes, uh, I expanded my role because in Montepaschi Group, which is the bank uh, where I used to work, uh, I was in charge of procurement, uh, logistics, uh, health and safety, and the security. 
so actually it was the highest uh, you know level of responsibility in my career because I mm, used to manage uh, approximately 1.4 billion of euro per year of purchasing turnover. Uh, 150 uh, employees under my responsibility in my organization and more than uh, 3,000 uh, branch offices uh, of the banks across Italy. So it was um, actually a very exciting time for me. Big job. So then you decided to pack it all in <laughs> and start a not-for-profit business, right? <laughs> what, what made you do that? And, and tell us a little more about it, Luca. Yes, someone uh, said that I was crazy in that time because I I left uh, you know my last position in Montepaschi when I was fifty, and uh, so joking I I used to say that uh, I wanted to do something different for the following fifty years. Okay, <laughs> so but well, uh, joking apart, so I I was. Um, interested in the fact that uh, before a, a very long career in, uh, in management, in procurement management, and with my passion for sustainability, uh, it was uh, the right time to, to say, okay, I want to match my management uh, you know, skill with my passion for sustainability. And so I established uh, my own company, which is called Right Hub in end of 2014. And uh, so that's uh, how it uh, it happened. I mean, yeah. It was similar for me, actually. I, I was 49 when I started Action Sustainability. I, I guess, yeah, you do come to that point in your career, in like you, in, in very large corporates for most of my career, where you go, actually, yeah, there, there must be something different out there and maybe a, a bit of a desire to put something back as well. So tell us about Right Hub, Luca. Tell us about what you do now. Yes, Right Hub is, uh, is a, a small company. Uh, it is a consultancy services company. And specifically, uh, our services are in uh, four areas, four key areas. The first one is uh, sustainable procurement and sustainable supply chain. Uh, what we are talking about, actually, I, uh, I don't think that I have to describe better uh, what it means, but if you want, I can go in the taste. The second area is something very new for the Italian market, which is uh, uh, social procurement and supply diversity. So we introduced uh, this kind of uh, service um, coming from my experience in uh, the Anglo-American uh, you know, companies where the diversity is uh, something very usual. And specifically, in, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the, the supplier base, no? so uh, it means that in Italy we apply the, the social procurement and supply diversity when we talk about uh, supply from social cooperatives uh, or social enterprises. So the not-for-profit organization, which can uh, you know, uh, supply goods and services and include uh, people with disabilities or anyway, fragile people, disadvantaged people. That's uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the second area of our services. The third one is the, the one related to the design and uh, execution of uh, sustainable uh, management for events. So we introduced this kind of service base also on the ISO 2121 uh, standard, which is the event sustainable management standard. And in that case, of course, uh, we, we design and execute the sustainable management of events, of so location for events, uh, uh, organizers of events, suppliers of goods and uh, services for events. Uh, and uh, because we have a very you know, uh, niche of business in the motorsport also, uh, racing, racing teams uh, can be, you know, certified according to the standard. The last one, but not the least, uh, is uh, the uh, work inclusion of people with disability. As I mentioned before, we work with the social cooperatives, which are very, very well, uh, uh, you know, popular in Italy and uh, maybe in Europe, Italy has been the first uh, nation uh, um, to, you know, uh, to establish a social cooperative system, let me say. And what we do is to work with uh, the Italian companies uh, which need to be in compliance with the mandatory Italian law to include people with disability from 15 employees up in order to make a sort of, uh, you know, uh, agreement 
uh, which allows to uh, buy from uh, a social cooperatives, uh, uh, which includes uh, the people with disability, and uh, uh, supply goods or services to the company which need to be in compliance. So this is, uh, you know, allows by the Italian law, and uh, we we have many projects. Uh, because of course uh, the company uh, don't have to hire uh, the people with disability, but they can procure goods and services from a social cooperatives uh, which hires uh, the people with disability. So, so that's actually law in Italy, Luca. It's it's not just like a public sector thing. Private businesses need to do this as yeah, well. Yeah, exactly. It's it's, uh, it's basically for both the kind of uh, sectors, the public and the private yeah. sector as well. Because there are many difficulties to hire people with disabilities. Mm. Sometimes uh, there are very, you know, pragmatic uh, difficulties because of the you know, layout of the space, manufacturing site, for instance, and so on. In some cases, uh, there is a question of uh, it's a matter of competence and skills uh, mm. across the, you know, the people with disabilities uh, area. There are difficulties to find people with uh, the proper. Uh, the competence, for instance, uh, I don't know, we work for IT companies, uh, they usually hire engineers, you know, <laughs> IT engineers, and, uh, you know, difficult, it's difficult to find uh, a large, uh, you know, number of people uh, in the disabilities, uh, you know, uh, scenario, as you say, yeah. So, are businesses just doing this because they have to, by law, or are some of your clients starting to see benefits of working more closely with disabled people? Well, actually, we try to sell this kind of services and uh, and opportunity for people as actually as an opportunity. So we don't care about uh, yeah. the fact that uh, we direct uh, um, we are directly in compliance with the law, but we suggest the company to take uh, uh, the chance and the opportunity uh, to leave this kind of uh, um, of activity uh, with. Uh, uh, you know, a CSR approach uh, or we have a social impact approach uh, and uh, we try to, to sell or to suggest the company to see also this kind of side of the, of the, of the, of the law, let me say. Yeah. No, in fact, uh, uh, what I would like to, to add, um, maybe it's more important, the fact that, uh, for instance, uh, a couple of months ago, we launched, uh, let me say, a product uh, called Right In in which we match uh, the sustainability objective with the inclusion objective. So we, uh, we, we propose the companies which want to be in compliance with the law uh, to uh, take uh, the opportunity to add uh, a sustainability project, for instance, I don't know, uh, trees plantation or refurbishment of a urban area or um, other kind of uh, projects uh, which are strictly related to the sustainable development uh, objectives. Okay, so, so you're bringing kind of environmental sustainability into, into that piece, so it's not just Exactly, about exactly. So we, we match uh, the social impact which comes from the inclusion of people with disability mm -hmm. and then the service is, for instance, uh, maintain uh, a, a, an urban area uh, very clean uh, with uh, the tree plantation, with gardening. I mean, there is a, really a very good uh, mix between the impact uh, from social point of view and from, uh, you know, the environmental point of view. So tell us more about MotoGP. Sounds very glamorous. Some people might say it's quite a wasteful thing to do and maybe not the most sustainable thing. What are you doing to help the, the industry to be more sustainable? Well, when we talk about motorsport, of course, it seems it is a paradox, I mean, because people think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, noise pollution or, you know, fuels or uh, engines, or they are just not uh, respectful of the environmental uh, and all, all of the events. But actually, if you look at, uh, you know, the numbers, uh, and the statistics, I mean, the number of bikes or the number of cars uh, racing uh, in a circuit, uh, are really uh, have a, really an impact uh, very very low in comparison with the overall impact of the event. So when we started in 2014, of course, uh, we have been as Martians uh, in working in that kind of industry. But uh, step by step, and year and in year by year, we convinced the, the organizer as well as the teams, uh, which was very very difficult in that time, the beginning to embrace uh, all our activities and even 
uh, you know, all the spectators uh, coming to uh, see a race. Uh, we have started to involve them in many, you know, activities with gaming and such kind of things. Uh, today, I have to be uh, frank that uh, in the last couple of years, uh, uh, the motorsport industry uh, really is making a very big, uh, big step uh, towards uh, sustainable management. Uh, even because uh, you know the international federations of motorcycling and uh, and uh, automobilism are doing a, really a, a good job. They implemented the sustainable management strategy last couple of years, uh, so they uh, declared uh, objectives. Uh, so I mean. Um, the world of motorsport is changing uh, quickly and rapidly. Yeah. So, so for you, it's about the event. It's about how people get there and what they do when they get there. Uh, yeah, exactly. In to the actual the... racing. <laughs> exactly. Actually, exactly. It is the overall event, but not only event. As I said before, we look after also the circuit uh, infrastructure. For instance, I don't know. Uh, we look at the fact that circuits. Uh, um, procure uh, uh, energy from renew renewable energy, you know, facilities, or for instance, the mobility. How you have, you can uh, reach uh, the circuit uh, uh, with uh, sustainable mobility, you know, public uh, transportation uh, or carpooling and so on. We look at the waste management and circular economy of the materials disposed uh, uh, during the event. Uh, we look at the stop food waste uh, we have a program uh, in order to collect uh, the surplus of food because look at the MotoGP event for instance uh, we have uh, more than 30 uh, different point of uh, um, restoration in the food and beverage and restaurants yeah. or hospitalities so it's a huge amount of uh, guests and a huge amount of food and beverage cooked or not cooked and at the end of the weekend of course uh, so there is the need to, you know, collect uh, the food surplus in order to, you know, to give to the people in need uh, around uh, the, the community and the territory where the event is hosted. So, Luca, as you mentioned, another part of your business is sustainable procurement. So I guess we ought to talk a little more about that. Yeah. How, are you, how are you seeing, I mean, you've been working in sustainable procurement in Italy for, I, I guess, 14, 15 years now. How are you seeing the progress of sustainable procurement in Italy, maybe compared to other parts of the world? Now, actually, in Italy, uh, the progress is very slow, to be frank, because, uh, as you said, uh, I have been working in this kind of sector uh, uh, for many years. Uh, and uh, yes, today we can state that the awareness about sustainable procurement uh, is increased uh, respect 10 years ago. But in terms of real and concrete projects, I still see a very slow progress, a very slow motion about the companies. Maybe one of the reasons is the fact that in Italy specifically, but I don't think it is different in other countries, the 90% or 99% of the companies are small and medium enterprises. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they are very maybe reluctant uh, to start a, a real re-engineering of the process, uh, and this makes things uh, more difficult. This doesn't mean that there are some companies which are working, and my, so I hope that uh, you know the, you know, the activities of uh, big companies and multinational companies can change also, you know, the, the small companies, the medium companies. Uh, in their, you know, um, approach to a sustainable management or their engineering of their their procurement processes. Yeah, I, I guess like you, I, I tend to see, although you know, in many countries in the world, the majority of businesses are small businesses, but the influential ones tend to be the larger ones. And I, I kind of always yeah. think that, you know, if, if we can exert that influence with the bigger companies, then it cascades down through the supply chain. How do you see the future, Luca? Are, are you seeing more take up of, of sustainable procurement? And if so, why? What, what's driving people these days to procure more sustainably? Now, actually, I see, uh, you know, a couple of uh, aspects. The first one is regulations, uh, rules, uh, something coming from uh, outside the company, for instance, investors. No? Uh, sometimes I, 
I met uh, companies in which uh, the investors uh, are asking them to do something uh, and um, make a commitment in sustainable management overall, and then it, uh, let me say, goes down to procurement as well. And so the first part is regulation rules, uh, um, influence from external factors, uh, investors as well, some rules of the European community regarding the reporting, for instance, or uh, the, the financial, the sustainable financial, uh, you know, scenario. Those are external. From internal, I see an improve of awareness uh, of the top manager, of the CEO, of the board in order to introduce uh, a very structured CSR program or sustainable development program, which includes also the sustainable uh, procurement, uh, you know, management, uh, and it, it means uh, re-engineering uh, the process of uh, the procurement organizations. So the ISO 2400 standard, Luca, is, is nearly five years old now. Are you seeing it being used in Italy? Is it a useful tool? Does it need to be changed? Do we, do we keep it or is it just something that is unnecessary? No, actually, uh, as, as all of the standards, even this is a, just, a, just so it is a guideline. It is not a, a standard which, uh, uh, you know, consider the certification uh, as other standards, of course. But first of all, maybe um, it is not well known enough, I mean. So maybe one step is to, you know, maybe to share and to promote uh, the 2400 uh, guideline uh, more than uh, we did in, in the past. Uh, because, of course, when you talk about the standard to the buyers, uh, they can be, you know, reluctant or uh, more distant from uh, a pragmatic understanding. And uh, so that's my, my suggestion. Uh, the second is that uh, in many cases uh, it applies to uh, to big uh, multinational company rather than uh, the small businesses. Uh, maybe small businesses doesn't understand uh, why they need to uh, to assess uh, uh, the procurement or to uh, uh, to make uh, changes based on uh, the um, the guideline. And uh, that, that's my, my my first let me say feedback to you. Do you think that the guidance standard helps? Is, are there benefits in it being guidance as opposed to a, a certifiable standard? Or, or should we should we change things in the future? Should Is a certificate going to be helpful? Uh, yeah, well, actually, I see that some cases I mentioned to uh, to our uh, to our colleague when we did, uh, you know, uh, the, the report of the situation around the world. So a couple of uh, the companies in Italy, which are uh, multinational companies, big companies, ask uh, an external, a third party, a certification body to evaluate uh, uh, the work done based on the ISO 2400. So, a sort of, uh, it is not a certification, sort of validation coming from an external uh, site, uh, maybe is more requested by the big companies. No? Uh, I, I strongly believe that uh, the ISO 2400 is really a very good tool uh, to understand, first of all, uh, your, your contest and uh, how you have to uh, face, uh, you know, uh, the gaps and, uh, and also improve, uh, improve your, uh, your management. So, and I, but actually, uh, I believe it's just a question to, uh, to inform, to promote uh, and to give uh, the right information about the benefits coming from uh, the application of the guideline. Brilliant. Well, Luca, thanks very much for, for those insights. It's always great to hear from people um, and particularly their career paths. And I, I guess a little bit like uh, a little bit like you, I started as a mechanical engineer and ended up in procurement and I was never quite sure why. A lot of us, are, I think, don't necessarily make procurement as a first choice of a profession it's something that we get into and I think a little bit like you again you, you go from kind of being the macho buyer to understanding that there are there are bigger things out there to, to think about yeah, so. actually, yeah actually Sean if I can add uh, so at the last minute to one thing I when I started to to, to work on uh, sustainable procurement I was very you know uh, very, very convinced that uh, it was only it was not only a benefit for my company, but it was first of all a benefit for my professionalism. And so I think that the buyer uh, needs to change his mind uh, 
in order to you know add something different a different way of uh, uh, living uh, your your uh, your work your job inside the company and even outside the company so it's a change of your mindset yeah, too i think you're absolutely right because actually uh, in my experience if you look at most organizations in most parts of the world do most of what they do through their supply chains so how can mm. procurement not be important in delivering on sustainability it, it's uh, in some sectors it's key as you know we do a lot of work in the construction sector and you know main yeah. contractors subcontracts at 80 percent of their their revenue so that they don't actually do very much they just just you know they just integrate a lot of suppliers into a, a project plan to, to build a building or a railway or some infrastructure or whatever so therefore you know procurement people are probably the most important people to help yeah. to deliver on on sustainability and i, I think that's a, a great point to close on because for those procurement people listening i you know, both of us luca and i i think both see the future of procurement professionals as as being the gatekeepers of sustainable development and that's so important you know we need to learn the skills and as you say adopt a different mindset yes and even because you know procurement function is the crossroads of other function inside the company you know research and development logistics production marketing communication so procurement can have really a very important uh, yeah. Uh, you know, a uh, weapon, let me say, in order to change things, uh, even, uh, you know, across all the other function in, in the company, yeah, in the organization. Brilliant. That's, that's a great note to end on, I think, Luca. So um, thanks very much. Thanks for sharing your, your experience and your views with us. For more information, please do go to iso2400.org, where there's lots of resources on sustainable procurement in multiple languages. Uh, there's a self-assessment tool that you can use and tons of collaboration and opportunities to, to learn and to develop. So, Luca, thanks very much and uh, great to talk Thank to you. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you to you, Sean, and looking forward to see you very soon okay okay thank you luca Take care. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. thank you for listening to our podcast on sense and sustainability please listen out for more episodes for more information learning resources tools and much more content on sustainable procurement go to www.iso2400.org